No, no, no. Why? Starship gets de-stacked, but why? New information regarding the second flight state, another crew launches to the ISS and Firefly has a fulminant comeback. Did you expect this? My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship updates. Believe it or not, this is the 300th episode of What About It. It's been four years since we began providing regular Y updates for you, our viewers, and we have no intentions to stop. In fact, we are planning the next level of Y right now, and we're almost ready for some giant announcements. Y 3.0 is coming. Thank you for your support. That's what makes all this happen. Let's dive right in for the 300th time. At the crack of dawn on September 14th, our eyes were glued to the webcams overlooking Starbase, Texas, so you don't have to. The reason? Ship 25's quick disconnect arm, which feeds the second stage with fuel and power, was pulled back, hinting at the inevitable. The stacking was about to unfold. As if on cue, Mechazilla's powerful arms gently lifted Ship 25, cautiously lowering it onto a transport stand that had been moved there just a few hours prior. This act ignited the spark for speculation across social media platforms, with space enthusiasts delving into theories. Was something wrong with Ship 25? Was it being sent back to the high bay for repairs? Fortunately, anxiety did not last for long. All thanks to Kathy Luders, the former chief of NASA's Human Spaceflight Division. Nowadays, she's overseeing the Starship development and she was the one to shed light on the situation, providing that much needed collective sigh of relief. She is one of the best hires for SpaceX in a long time. She knows what's up. According to her, there is no need to panic. The prototypes are fine. Ship 25 needed to come down for the final touches, with the installation of the FTS system and other last minute checks being among them. The second mission is crucial for the Starship development, so SpaceX is dotting the I's and crossing the T's to ensure nothing short of perfection. The motto of the first Starship launch was full send, this time it is let's reach orbit. Unfortunately, it appears that the September launch is no longer on the table. The Federal Aviation Administration has informed Reuters that they are trying their best to have the license ready by the end of October. What's holding them up? A newsletter from the FAA on September 15th spilled the beans they are re-evaluating the Starbase environmental assessment from 2022. The culprit could be the newly introduced water deflector at the orbital launch mount, which discharges significant volumes of water near the launch pad. While it may sound insignificant, we don't know how that water will affect the surrounding environment in the long run. Is it toxic? Hard to say, there has just never been a comparable rocket. In my view, there is minimal cause for concern about the FAA's language. It likely serves as a way to assure the public that both SpaceX and the FAA are operating by the book. That's especially important considering the ongoing lawsuit filed after the first flight. The only mildly worrying aspect? The FAA's need for consulting with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This agency isn't known for speed to say the least. Fishing is a work of patience after all. Before you let frustration creep in over the additional weight, it's worth stepping back to view the bigger picture. In the grand undertaking that is space exploration, a month or even two barely matter. Imagine a near future where Starship launches are as commonplace as Falcon 9's are today. These delays will long be forgotten by then. So when do you think the stars will align for the second Starship's launch? Leave your most precise guesses in the comments below. All this being said, there's also a huge upside to all of this. This delay offers SpaceX additional time for fine-tuning the launch complex and the rocket itself. They can now make it count, and that is going to be a very exciting journey to witness. Before we get to that, here is a fun side detail we saw a lot of questions about. Our on-site photographer at Starbase, John, recently caught an intriguing change. The Orbital Launch Integration Tower, or OLED, now sports a GOAT logo on its Drawworks cover. 
This is a tribute to Mechazilla, the GOAT, the greatest of all time in crane technology. Of course, it is a charming nod that adds character to the site. Zooming out, you'll notice the colossal tanks of the orbital tank farm. With the unexpected weight, the Starbase teams have already started diligently enhancing its capabilities. The introduction of new pumps and subcoolers means that once everything is connected, the fueling process for Starship will be twice as fast. Here is something to think about. This isn't just about rapid launches, it is also a matter of saving fuel. When propellant sits idle in the tanks for too long, it heats up, turns into gas and has to be vented off. But that's not what you want. The name of the game here is efficiency. Adding all these capabilities will give SpaceX the opportunity to recycle the fuel more efficiently. Less venting means more efficiency. Basically, each venting can be seen as dollar bills blasting out the side of the rocket. And it doesn't stop there. Let's shift gears from the launch site to see what's unfolding at SpaceX's built site down Highway 4. This is where we can find the latest greatest Ship 28. It's recently undergone some fascinating modifications. With a little luck, this particular prototype holds the potential to set the standard for the inaugural fleet of operational starships. While Ship 25 and 26 serve merely as simple test vessels, Ship 28 has all the features an operational starship needs, especially after the mysterious demise of Ship 27. Not only is this prototype fully covered with heat tiles, but it also features a payload bay fortified with a robust door. The implication? This could very well be the first starship to carry a payload of next-gen Starlink V2 satellites. This ship could be the game-changer we are waiting for. If it successfully deploys this cargo and survives re-entry, Ship 28 could very well become the template for a reliable first-edition standard-issue starship. Currently, this prototype is stationed at the engine installation stand, where all six of its Raptors were fitted a little while ago. Besides being a possible first fully operational starship, what should intrigue you about this ship are the updates it received in recent days. Initially, its upper nose cone vent hole was covered with an object resembling a cowbell. While similar vents have been seen in the past, what captures our curiosity here is that this one is black, diverging from the traditional raw stainless steel. The plot thickens. On September 15th, the ship's two lower vent holes were also covered, yet these differ significantly from anything previously seen at Starbase. Crafted from what appears to be Starship heat tiles or a material meant to mimic them, the covers also feature two sets of holes at the bottom and one at the top. What is this thing? Are these holes designed to be some sort of thrusters that use boiled off gas for in-space maneuvering? If so, what role do the heat tiles play? This leads us to question whether the upper cowbell-shaped vent might also be made from this same material. Our only hint here comes from Ship 24, where this specific area was treated with black, heat-resistant paint. But why? We can at least guess. That paint was probably there to protect the body of the prototype from heat during re-entry, even though we never came close to witnessing it. My speculation is that SpaceX intends for these vents to redirect gases, but due to their protrusion from the vehicle's body, these could interact with the plasma created during re-entry. Hence, additional thermal protection might be necessary to mitigate risk during this critical phase. Do you have a different take on this? If so, feel free to share your theory in the comments. Let's now venture even further down Highway 4 where, after a brief drive, we reach the Massey's test site. Our latest aerial imagery from September 15th showcases the towering Super Heavy Booster 10, which made its appearance here on September 11th following an extended stay in the Mega Bay. As anticipated, the prototype was put through a series of cryogenic tests shortly thereafter. The first of these, conducted on September 13th, was somewhat of a rare sight. Over a span of a few hours, the methane tank of this behemoth was filled with liquid nitrogen and once full, it was promptly detanked. We don't often see just the methane tank being tested, so it is hard to tell what's the purpose of this test. Two days later, a similar test was conducted, this time focusing on the liquid oxygen tank, which was partially filled before also being detanked. 
With road closures announced for September 18th and 19th, so yesterday and today, it is likely we'll witness this prototype making its way back to the build site, where it is expected to enter the mega bay for engine installation. Expanding our scope beyond Boca Chica, a 720 km or 450 mile journey from Starbase brings us to SpaceX's McGregor test site. SpaceX has facilities throughout the US after all. This is where the majority of Raptor engines undergo rigorous testing before being shipped to the build site. Recent footage shared from McGregor has spotlighted a pair of particularly intriguing tests. According to a NASA article, last month SpaceX successfully executed a cold start of a Raptor vacuum engine. If you're wondering what a cold start means, imagine trying to start your car on a frigid winter morning. We're talking the coldest winter morning you could possibly imagine. Essentially, the engine was brought down to temperatures akin to those encountered in a vacuum of space after a long coast phase, let's say on a trip to the Moon and Mars. Next, the engineers tried to spin up and ignite the Raptor, and it passed the test flawlessly. In addition to this, another video emerged, displaying the powered descent profile test of a standard, atmosphere-optimized Raptor engine. And not just any descent profile, we are talking moon landing here. Although the footage is a brief 31 seconds, NASA revealed that the complete burn duration was 281 seconds long. This powered descent is but one segment of the complex landing sequence. Closer to the surface, Starship will use a circle of thrusters to softly touch down on the silver globe, hopefully without kicking up too much dust. Interestingly, the first of these tests took place in August of this year, while the latter one was conducted as far back as November 2021. It was among the initial milestones required for the human landing system contract that SpaceX secured. That contract includes a Starship test landing on the Moon as well as developing landers for the Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions. Even though Artemis 3 is slated for December 2025, any visible lunar hardware remains somewhat scarce at Starbase. However, just because we don't see it doesn't mean that progress isn't in full swing. Over a year ago, SpaceX was already prototyping the key elements of the lunar Starship, such as an elevator and potentially an airlock. Presently, teams at Starbase are constructing another mock-up, which will likely feature components like crew cabins, control panels, and workspaces. Given Starship's considerable dimensions, astronauts aboard will enjoy a level of spatial freedom far exceeding the confines of the Apollo and even the Orion capsules. We can only hope that NASA will eventually share some pictures of this prototype. What do you think? Will Starship touch down on the moon before 2026? Should we even hope to see this milestone being achieved by the end of this decade? Leave your opinions in the comments, I always try to read them. Here is something of a personal interest to you. Did you know that YouTube sometimes unsubscribes you without knowing? We've seen a massive number of people unaware that they were unsubscribed. Maybe you're one of them. Be sure to check that subscribe button just to make sure even if you were already subscribed. While at it, remember to leave a like, comment and consider becoming a Y supporter, a group you can join for as low as a dollar a month. You get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. The next flyover will likely happen on the day you watch this episode. And we don't exclude you just because you might have less money to spare. Everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. The link to our Patreon page is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams on our team. Over 100 again in the past two weeks. We'll put your funds to good use. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Weather. It's the one thing that impacts us daily and for space enthusiasts like us, it means so much more. Whether you're traveling miles for a launch or eagerly awaiting for the docking of a Dragon capsule to the ISS, weather can make or break your experience. But with my radar, you get to be one step ahead. Wondering if it's going to be a dry launch day? My radar gives you that clarity. No more surprises with rain or clouds. One of my favorite features, the orbital tracking. Just put in any space track ID and voila! Watch the location and orbit of your chosen satellite or 
your space module in real time. And for those of us who felt the thrill of a launch being on the water, my radar has another surprise. Imagine you're out on a boat, awaiting a summer launch. My radar detects lightning nearby, keeping you safe. And if you're just curious about that approaching storm, my radar will tell you if it's just passing by or here to stay. They even booked a Falcon for launching their own satellites to take images, watch over the Earth for wildfires, hurricanes and other phenomena, all to be accessible right from within the app. Space, weather, safety. My radar brings it all together. Dive deep into those less known features and who knows, you might just find your next favorite tool for your space adventures. Stay ahead, stay informed with my radar. Let's drop Starship for now and check out the latest news from the aging International Space Station. In late August, the world witnessed the arrival of three astronauts and one cosmonaut aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endurance capsule. Fast forward to September 15th, just three weeks later, and another crewed mission took to the skies, this one orchestrated by Russia's space agency Roscosmos. Dubbed MS-24, the mission featured a Soyuz capsule carrying three crewed members. At the helm was mission commander Oleg Kononenko embarking on his fifth journey into space. Accompanying him were first flight engineer Nikolai Chub of Roscosmos and second flight engineer Laura O'Hara from NASA, both experiencing their maiden voyages to space. This collaborative launch of cosmonauts and astronauts is made feasible through an agreement between NASA and Roscosmos. The pact ensures that each agency will carry a crew member from the other. It prevents a scenario where a grounded Crew Dragon would prevent US access to the International Space Station and vice versa. Just three hours after the launch, the MS-24 capsule successfully docked to the Razved Nadir port of the ISS. Three hours to the ISS, this is fantastic! After a few days of transitional activities to acclimate the newcomers, the MS-22 crew will make their return journey to Earth. Now, if you've been paying close attention, you might be wondering, wait, what happened to MS-23? Allow me to explain. Initially, the crew of MS-24 was slated to launch as MS-23. However, the preceding MS-22 crew encountered a dangerous situation when their Soyuz capsule was hit by a micrometeorite, causing a leak in the spacecraft's coolant system. This led to rising onboard temperatures and created a risk for the crew suffering serious harm or even fatalities during re-entry. Two months later, a docked Progress capsule also faced a similar cooling system failure, amplifying the urgency to act. Ultimately, it was decided that it's better to be safe than sorry, so another uncrewed Soyuz capsule was dispatched to function as a lifeboat for MS-22. This mission was named MS-23, which explains why there is a gap in the crew naming. Thankfully, the emergency plan worked smoothly, and the MS-22 crew is scheduled to return safely to Earth on September 27th aboard the MS-23 capsule. The MS-24 team, on the other hand, will reside on the ISS for an approximate duration of 180 days or roughly 6 months. Speaking of 6 months, that's the time frame Firefly Aerospace was given by the Space Force to be launch ready any day, a target they've impressively met. We've discussed the Tactical Responsive Space Program before, a Space Force initiative aimed at swiftly replacing damaged satellites or deploying new ones during emergencies in orbit. For example, during a Space War or Star War. The previous record for this program was set by Northrop Grumman in 2021 with the Tech RL-2 mission. Back then, they managed to prepare the payload and launch their Pegasus XL rocket in just 21 days. That is impressive. However, Firefly's challenge under this program was on a whole new level. Upon receiving the GO signal from the Space Force, Firefly had a mere 24 hours to perform a long series of actions. That includes final satellite testing and encapsulating the payload. Then the entire thing had to be transported to the launch pad and mated with the rocket. Finally, after moving to a vertical position, the Alpha's software had to be updated and the thing was ready to launch. All of that in a single day, redefining the term full send. After entering the launch readiness period in late August, the GO signal came on September 13th. 
So did Firefly manage to launch within that narrow window? The answer is a resounding yes. The Victus Knox mission transitioned from a payload in a warehouse state to a satellite in the correct orbit all within 27 hours. The rocket itself was ready to go in under 24 hours, but the launch had to wait for the right window. Details about the payload remain classified, revealing only that it was some kind of technology demonstrator. Probably a less expensive spy satellite. As you can imagine, the success of this mission has been met with considerable enthusiasm from the Space Force as it opens the gates for rapid response launches. It was also a monumental day for Firefly Aerospace. After two unsuccessful attempts, their third Alpha launch turned out to be a resounding victory. They are back. Consequently, the company has revealed plans to accelerate production, which also implies more frequent launches. The next one might even occur before the end of this year. As the saying goes, third time's the charm, kudos to Firefly. While Firefly workers are likely having a good time thanks to their success, Virgin Galactic has its own reasons to celebrate. The company successfully executed its fourth launch this year and is already gearing up for the next one. After the FAA grounded VSS Unity for flying out of the reserved airspace, the company took their time to improve the spacecraft to allow for easier maintenance and it shows. The pioneer in space tourism has made an impressive comeback, as since May they've been launching commercial flights at a monthly rate. One such venture was the Galactic 03 flight on September 8th. Paying tourists Ken Baxter, Tim Nash and Adrian Reynard were released from the VMS EVE mothership before the onboard engine of the Spaceship 2 propelled them to an altitude of 88.6 kilometers or about 55.1 miles. Though the entire flight lasted a mere 12 minutes and 37 seconds, I can only imagine how thrilling that experience was. An interesting note about these passengers is that they were among the earliest believers in Virgin Galactic's vision. Ken Baxter, for instance, bought the first ever ticket from the company all the way back in 2004. Back then he paid 200,000 American dollars. Accounting for inflation, that ticket would be worth approximately $330,000 in today's money. Fresh off the success of completing another mission, Virgin Galactic has already scheduled its next commercial flight for October 5th. While the identities of the passengers remain unknown, we do know they will be from the US, the UK and Pakistan. Digging a bit further, we were able to discover that the Pakistani astronaut is likely Namira Salim, a polar adventurer who has long aspired to be the first Pakistani in space. With this latest news, Virgin Galactic may become a leader in suborbital tourism as their main competitor, Blue Origin, still hasn't launched since they've lost a booster in September 2022. However, the cost of operations at the current rate, Virgin is burning roughly $1.5 million per day, leaving room for debate about the company's long-term viability. But that's a topic for another day. For now, Virgin Galactic is busy fulfilling dreams. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. Link is in the description. And if you want to get even smarter about space and rockets, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. The prototype. This just doesn't fit into the script. By the end of this decade. Orbital. And one on one cosmonaut. <laughs> nice.